All right, here we are, top 10 sins and struggles. This is uh, lesson number five. Uh, we continue with our survey, survey results taken in this congregation. Today we're going to look at the number six uh, sin. Let's go, there we go. Uh, if we count them down, 10, laziness, nine, anger, eight, cursing and gossiping, seven, pride, coming in at number six, neglecting church, neglecting church. So this is a pretty common problem, so we're going to look at some of the reasons why brethren do this and why we need to make an effort at attendance and service and all that, all that good stuff. Obviously I'm preaching to the choir, because so, you're here. You know. But uh, uh, there's, some, there's some aspects about church attendance that sometimes we don't think about that creep into our lives, so I think it'd be a good thing to talk about that. You know, people uh, said a variety of things in their comments about this particular struggle. Uh, they didn't just say missing church, but you know, neglecting church services or neglecting to give regularly. I kind of put all that together. Uh, neglecting to serve in some way. You know, I'm not doing as much as I ought to do. You know, all of that, I, I kind of grouped this under uh, neglecting church. Um, but all these other you know, ancillary things, they all start with the habit of neglecting to come regularly to the services of the church, these other things. Note that the Hebrew writer says, you know, in Hebrews 10.25, we always quote the scripture and we're going to talk about it in a minute. He said, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some. So in speaking of the worship and other gatherings of the church, the writer here in Hebrews, um, encourages them not to change the habit of coming to church for the habit of not coming to church. And that's what, I, that's what usually happens. We, ha we, we have this habit of coming to church and then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, we start getting the habit of not coming to church. And therein lies the answer to the problem of neglecting worship and other problems that stem from this. You know, neglecting in our giving, neglecting in our serving, that type of thing. So if one can cultivate the habit of coming to church rather than the habit of not coming to church or not attending, then the other stuff kind of falls into place. Of course, regular church attendance has always been a problem. Like this is nothing new. If the Hebrew writer was writing about it in the first century, it means they were having the problem of people not coming to services back in the first century, because he had to encourage them you know, not to lose the habit of coming to, coming to the church. Uh, and, and believe it or not, the excuse has always been pretty much the same. So to help us become a little more faithful in this area, I've compiled 10 of the most common excuses, and if there's anybody in this room who would know excuses for not coming to church, usually the preacher you know, collects these. You know, other people collect stamps, I collect excuses that people give for not coming to church. And maybe uh, I'll also give you uh, 10 reasons for not coming to church that people give me and three uh, for actually coming, uh, coming to church. And maybe it'll help shed the light on this, help us to overcome some of the issues when they happen in our lives. All right, top 10 reasons. Top 10 reasons for missing church. Number 10, I'm Jewish. Obviously the main reason why people don't come to church is because the vast majority of people in the world are not Christians. So this lesson is not for you. If you're in the room and you know, you're not a Christian, this lesson is not for you. If you're watching this on, you know, online or on video uh, later on and you're a Mormon, uh, not a Mormon, but a, a Hindu or something, this, this lesson is not for you. The number of believers in the world today, interesting statistic, is about the same as it was in 1830. But the world's population has gone from two billion to six billion. See the problem there? This is why the Great Commission is still in force today. There are more souls to reach out to, but there are less Christians to bring the gospel to them. So we need every Christian in church because we need every Christian. Okay? Number nine. I'm sick. 
Each week someone, somewhere, among those who regularly attend are ill or they're taking care of somebody who is ill. That's normal. You know, preachers would love to have 100% attendance, but it just never happens. There's always somebody who's sick or somebody taking care of somebody who's sick. Statistics in church surveys tell us any given time that number is five to 10 percent. Interesting, uh, that number used to be in our assemblies, you know, at any given time, eight to 10 percent of the people were absent for a, a variety of reasons 20, 25 years ago. Today, it's closer to 20 percent. That's why we put you know, in our statistics potential attendance, that means counting all the families and their children that, are, that count themselves as members in this congregation, potential attendance, 410. Actual attendance, 301. That's 109 people that have publicly stated they've been baptized or, or, their, or their children part of a family. There's 109 of them not here. So we need to kind of keep that, keep that in mind. Of course, the danger is that a period of illness breaks the cycle of regular attendance and a member picks up the habit of irregular attendance. That's the thing about being sick, especially long-term illness or taking care of someone long-term and then finally that person gets better or you know, that crisis is over and you found yourself for the last couple of months kind of being spotty, skipping here, skipping there, coming only once out of three times and pretty soon that becomes the habit. So the crisis is over, but, in, in, but, but during the crisis, while we had a legitimate reason not to come, once the crisis is over, we, we carry on with that bad habit of being irregular. Number eight, I'm changing. Life is a continual process of change. Moving, going off to college, getting married, getting divorced, having babies, new jobs, having more babies. In our case, having still more babies. And with these changes come interruptions in our routines and in our habit. And as I said in the previous reason, one habit that suffers during a period of change is usually church attendance, just like it does when there's long-term illness. So coming to church, sometimes it gets packed away with other items that we, we've promised ourselves that we're going to sort it all out once we get settled. And lots of times, church attendance never gets unpacked. We kind of get settled into a new routine, a new job, a new this, a new that, and all of a sudden, whoops. Number seven, I'm working. Remember, excuses for not coming. I didn't say they were bad excuses, I'm just saying they're excuses. Now there was a time when industry and government recognized that this was a Christian country and working on Sunday or irregular shifts was less prevalent. When I was younger, I used to hate Sundays because nothing was open on Sundays. There was nothing to do on Sunday. Everything was closed. Even the movie, how, where I was anyways in Canada, there was no movies. You, didn't, you couldn't even go to the movies on Sunday. Everything was shut down. But that's not, that's not like it is today, right? Today we live in a multiracial, multi-religious country where people accommodate schedules and not the other way around. So providing for family, that's a priority, absolutely. First Timothy 5.8, you know, Paul tells us, you know, the one who doesn't care for his family is worse than an infidel. So yeah, providing for our family, that is important. It's just unfortunate that society makes that something that interferes more and more with our spiritual lives. Sometimes, however, we work because we'd rather get ahead in the world than get ahead in the kingdom. Sometimes we don't have to volunteer for that overtime shift. We don't have to volunteer to work on Sundays, but we just do. Number six, I'm new. One of the most embarrassing moments for the preacher is announcing the good news that we have a new brother or sister in Christ, you know, they've been baptized, and we ask them to stand up at the morning service, they're not there. <laughs> and then they don't show up on Wednesday either. So young Christians, you know, they may know about the gospel and they may have understood how to be saved, but they also need to be trained in Christian living and, and patiently taught about the need and the rewards of regular church attendance because their, their faith is weak, because they're, they're new, they don't, they don't know everything. 
They need to be strengthened. So coming to church regularly is an acquired habit developed by word and example, but it has to be taught. It doesn't come automatically with baptism. Just because somebody accepts to be baptized doesn't mean that they automatically know about all the services that are available at the church or automatically feel that they ought to be at all the services of the church. They need to be taught that. Number five, I'm busy. Now there's a difference between I'm working and I'm busy. One is need, the other is want. The busy person, you know, not a bad person, they're just busy. In the parable of the sower and the seed in Matthew 4, 18, 19, Jesus describes that busy person to a T. That person's busy, concerned with problems, busy getting ahead, busy building a place for himself here in this world. I'm busy. Of course, this person here has a priority problem. He or she allows the urgent things in this life to take over the important things. You've heard that before. Busy people don't realize that God has promised that if we put kingdom things first, and kingdom things well, like church attendance, that's a kingdom thing. He says if we put kingdom things first, He is going to find a way to provide all of these other things that we're so busy trying to acquire for ourselves. You know, the promise, and it's a promise He makes. He says, you make me first, you make the kingdom first, you make that a priority, and all those other things that you're sweating about, you know, a place to live, food, eat, blah, 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 all those other things, I'll make sure you get those. You know, J.C. Penney, the penny stores, you know, J.C. Penney, that was a real person, obviously, J.C. Penney. He was a very religious man. And he said, um, if a person is too busy to worship, that person's just too busy. <laughs> and isn't it interesting? Chick-fil-A, they're closed on Sundays. Doesn't seem to be hurting their bottom line. <laughs> they're the fastest growing fast food you know, chain in America. And look at all the bad press they got you know, because of the the, the, uh, because the owner, uh, you know, the top guy, did not say anything about uh, homosexuals or gay marriage. He just said he favored traditional marriage, that he favored traditional marriage. He was an old-fashioned kind of guy. They closed down their stores on Sunday because they feel it's important that families have a day. You know, Sunday is a day for family. You know, he didn't push his religion on anybody. And he sure puts his money where his mouth is. Can you imagine <laughs> shutting down on Sunday? And boy, did he ever take a lot of flack. And I remember when that thing happened and, 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 and people pushed back, right? I mean, Lise and I, we went to a, a Chick-fil-A just for lunch when all of that was happening. Are you kidding me? The line was out the door. So here's a guy who, you know, he, he makes the priorities. And maybe, maybe the gross amount is less than perhaps another corporation, but really, do you really need the extra two billion if you've already got a couple of billion? You know, I mean. Number four. Yes, I forgot to put that there. Number four, I'm hurt. Remember, reasons for not coming to church. I'm hurt. Many people come less and less to church because they've been genuinely hurt. Hurt by another member's comment or attitude. Hurt by a perceived lack of attention by the leaders or the ministers. Hurt by some things that are being done in a way that they don't agree with, whatever that might be. Hurt by the preacher or teacher in a lesson. You know, the preacher says something in the pulpit and they really feel, wow, he's talking to me and they're hurt, they get their feelings hurt. And I've, you know, you've heard me say this, I don't know how many times, there's no name on the bullet. Preachers do not preach to 400 people just to talk to one person, unless it's Bud. But other than that, <laughs> you, know what I, you know what I'm saying, right? If I have something to say as a minister to one person, I will go to that one person and say, brother, sister, I think this thing in your life you need to be paying attention. I'm not going to waste an entire sermon just to talk to one person. But some people actually think that the preacher's guy, you know, oh man, this is, this is going out to you. This one's for you. No. But some people get hurt. They take it, 
they take it personally. Now it's unfortunate when this happens and I'm persuaded that when there is an offense, I don't think it's intentional. And it's sad when people leave the church and it's unfortunate when they leave for these reasons. But there's two reasons why it's terrible that they would leave in such circumstances. Number one, leaving the church because you're offended will not justify you before God. You know, Jesus warned His disciples that they would be subjected to persecution, false teachers, and sufferings of all kinds, spiritual, physical, even environmental. And what does he say at the end? But the one who endures until the end, that one will be saved. So regardless of the offense, leaving the church is not the answer, nor is it God excuses. Sister so-and-so, you, know, you got crossways with sister so-and-so for whatever reason and you left in a huff and never came back to church, you think you're going to go before the Lord in judgment and he would, He's going to say, oh Susie, that's fine, well, I was offended too, she shouldn't have said that. No, it's not how it works. And another reason that it's sad when somebody leaves under these circumstances, stopping a regular attendance because we are hurt or hurting Sometimes we're hurting because of some loss or tragedy or disappointment and we decide to take it out on God by ignoring Him. You know, my, my, my child died, whatever, you know, got hit by a car and died and that's terrible and I'm mad and God, why did you do this? You know, I'll show you, I'm never coming back to church. Really? You're going to punish God this way? That's not the answer. The answer is, if we're offended by someone, is to go to that brother or sister one-on-one -on -one and say, brother, sister, you know, when you said this, I, I just felt that that offended me, that hurt my feet, and so on and so forth. You know, they, they, don't, they don't accept it, bring another, bring a witness, bring two. We have a way of handling offenses you know, between ourselves. And if you're hurt because of something that's happened that you feel is unfair in life, you're mad at God, whatever, what does James tell us? You know, call on the elders, have them pray with you, counsel with you, see one of the ministers, whatever. But abandoning the church, that's never the answer to taking care of, a hurt, of hurt feelings. Okay? Number three, I'm lazy. <laughs> I've only met one person in my career who actually sincerely acknowledged that this was the cause of many of his problems. It was a man many of his problems and failures. And actually, I admired this person for, you know, at least he coughed it up, said, so I'm just lazy, I'm bone lazy, I just find it hard to make the effort. You know? Let's face it, going to church on a regular basis requires physical and mental effort. It does. Preparation and travel multiplied way over if you have small children. You know, Jesus said, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a room in my father's house for you, there's a special spot for mothers who have brought small children regularly to church. And that room up in heaven doesn't have any children in it. I think that's the, that's the reward. It requires discipline to sit and to listen. It requires work if you're Teaching, imagine, you have to prepare your class that you're going to be teaching, you know, Sunday school, whatever, and then after that, taking care of your own kids, and then after that, there's the service. And, and that's multiplied even more if you happen to be, if it's a, if it's a sister, she's married to a brother, uh, not a brother, she's married to a man who's not a member of the church and who doesn't come to church. Whoa, then she has to you know, get home at a reasonable time. She wants to make lunch, keep him happy as well. It's not easy. Not easy at all. And then of course, mental effort. I mean, it's a, it's a Bible class. You're learning stuff. And spiritual effort that comes with the continual adjustments and changes demanded by, not the preacher, but by the Holy Spirit as He molds us into a Christ-like image. I want to be like Christ, but I'll tell you one thing. The transformation from Mike Mazzalongo as he is naturally into a more Christ-like human being, that's a very painful process. 
Because I have to, as you do too, overcome my flesh. And I say to my flesh, from now on, we're going to be doing this. And my flesh says, over my dead body you will. Right? So the definition of a lazy person, according to the dictionary, is, quote, one who dislikes physical or mental effort. Proverbs says it this way. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He is weary of bringing it to his mouth again. Proverbs 26, 15. What, what is he saying here? Well, he's saying the lazy man won't even feed himself. That's how lazy he is. So the Lord provides for the nourishment of the only thing that will survive this world, and that is a person's soul. And what the writer here is saying is that laziness keeps so many people from actually feeding themselves on a regular basis. He's not talking about just regular food here. He's saying the lazy man's soul, they won't even, the word is there, the teachers are there, they won't even take the food into their into their spirit. So the Lord provides the nourishment of the only thing that'll survive this world, a person's soul, and yet laziness keeps so many from feeding themselves on a regular basis. So the best way to deal with laziness is to acknowledge it as sin and ask God's help to overcome every day, especially on Sunday. Number two reason, I'm worldly. One of the saddest stories in the Bible is a reference to Demas. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, and in Philemon, verse 24, Demas is counted among Paul the Apostle's helpers and as a faithful disciple of the Lord. And then in his very last letter from Rome, Paul refers to Demas, but this time he says, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica, 2 Timothy 4.10. Isn't it amazing? You have a guy who's helping one of the inspired apostles, observing the miracles, part of the work, mentioned in an inspired letter. You know, he, this is a guy, he's a disciple, he's, a, he's one of us. And then a couple of epistles later, the same apostle speaking about the same guy says, he's abandoned me. He's gone back to the world. Wow, that is sad. So some Christians, you know, they don't come regularly because, well, they love the Lord more, they love the world just more than they love the Lord. They love the smell of money more than the smell of sacrifice of praise. They love the activity and the allurements and the pleasures of this world more than the activities and pleasures and promises of the next world. John says it this way in John 3:19. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Some people say, why, why, do, why do so many people reject the gospel? Why won't my uncle you know, accept the gospel? And usually the answer is, well, because he likes sin more than he likes the gospel, period. He likes the darkness more than he likes the light. So we're in, when we're involved in some kind of a sin of some kind, especially if it's a Christian and, and this is your secret life of sin, you have no, if you have no desire to let go of that sin, then you have less and less desire to come to church. Because when you come to church, what happens? Well, the big, the big floodlights go on and they're shining on your life, all of our lives, and they're exposing the darkness. And people who want to maintain that secret sin, they don't like the darkness being exposed. And so they just come less and less and less. It's not a nice experience for them. So worldliness you know, is such an insidious vice because it, it eats away at our spiritual life quietly and without pain until we're cold and dead in Christ, but we don't even realize it until it's too late. We just keep making one little concession to the world after another until we're no longer of the kingdom, but of the world. And usually the first thing to go is regular church attendance. Satan's number one point of attack is to diminish your exposure to the word of God and your exposure to other Christians. And he does that by finding all kinds of reasons to take you out of church. And then the number one reason 
for not coming to church. Number one excuse, well, you fill in the blank. That's your excuse. Your reason for not being faithful to all the services of the church, whatever reason that may be, it could be any of the nine that I just mentioned or one I haven't mentioned, but it's the number one reason if it keeps you out of services. Maybe you don't think you need to be here every time. Maybe you're not convinced the Lord wants you to be at all the services. Maybe you don't get anything out of church services, whatever, you, know, you fill it in. So whatever the reason, Satan has managed to find an opening in your spiritual defense and convinced you somehow that not coming to church, well, that's okay. Well, in the last section of this lesson, I, I want to give you three reasons why you should come. So those are some of the common excuses. Let me give you three reasons why you should come. Some people ask, and I get this question, well, do I have to be there Sunday and Wednesday? Do I have to come to all the services? And if you're expecting an answer from me, this is the answer I give to when they ask me that question. If you ask this question, your problem is not church attendance. Your problem is love and gratitude and respect for the Lord. That's your problem. And we'll deal with that later. For now, three reasons to come regularly. Reason number one, it pleases God. God is pleased. In Psalm 69, the writer says, I will praise the name of God with song and magnify Him with thanksgiving and it will please the Lord better than an ox or a young bull with horn, horns and hoofs. God has always desired that His people gather to worship Him and that they do it often. He's always wanted that. Isaiah 56 says, also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. God was always very specific about keeping the people true to the day of worship and He was pleased with those who kept it. And He's saying here, Isaiah, one day God will bring everybody to His house. It won't be just exclusively for the Jews. Everybody will have that privilege and God wants that from everyone. Ephesians chapter five, Paul says, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So if you're, if, you're, if you're parsing this sentence here, this, this little uh, sentence here, you realize what he says, right? Understand what the will of the Lord is, period. So he's now going to explain what is the will of the Lord. Well, here it is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That's what the Lord wants. And then he says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what the Lord wants. Singing, making melody with your heart to the Lord. That's what the Lord wants. So God desires that we be involved in this type of activity when we are together, rather than worldly pursuits. You have, an, you have a choice of activities on Sunday, on Wednesday, whatever. The Bible says, but this is what God wants you to choose. Hebrews 13 says, through Him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to His name, and do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. God is pleased to see us offering His praise. He loves to see it. And God is the same in the Old and the New Testament. If you think for a second, okay, what God deserves is that we worship Him 24 hours a day, nonstop, every day of our lives. That's what He deserves. That's how great God is. That's how, there's no word for it, that's how awesome God is. He is worthy for us to, to be praising Him continually all the time. He's worth it. The problem is we just can't do that. We neither have the strength nor the spiritual ability 
to be able to do that. And so we select times when we offer a portion of what we ought to be offering. And by offering Him a portion of what we ought to be offering, He blesses us and permits us to continue living in this world without continually worshiping. And worshiping Him instead of by praise and song and so on and so forth, we worship Him by doing our jobs properly and loving our wives properly and taking care of our children and all in His name and depending on Him. So pleasing God is what our life is really about. To know and glorify Him is the essential meaning of life. When we worship Him, we know we are doing the right thing. When we worship, we have reached the zenith of what life is all about, the highest thing. Not coming to church requires an excuse, good or bad. But being here never requires an excuse. <laughs> have you ever had to have an excuse that you're here studying or worshiping? Our conscience is clear because we are doing the absolute right thing tonight. Absolute. You want to please someone you love, this is the plain truth, then being here and being here every time pleases God and demonstrates our love for Him. Now the problem many times is that we would rather please ourselves or make church attendance, you know, we'd rather make that convenient and fun and easy and pleasant, so on and so forth. But we need to remember that the object of worship is to please God, not us. I'm not here to please me, I'm here to please Him. So number one reason, why should we come? God loves it when we come. He wants us to come. It's not a, thou shalt be here and do. It's not that, it's I love when you're with me. I love when you're talking to me. I love when you're praising me. I love this. And I'll bless you for this. Number two, being here strengthens our faith. When people have problems and you ask them what they need, aside from physical help, usually they say, would you pray that I have more faith? Ask God to help me have a stronger faith so I can get through this thing, whatever that thing is. The apostles, you know, they witnessed the miracles and yet when it came time to ask Jesus for something, what did they ask Him? They said, Lord, please increase our faith. Luke 17, 5. So faith is not only necessary for salvation, but it's also necessary to be able to persevere through the ups and downs of life so we can obtain that salvation. You know, it's such an important thing, you know, faith. How do you require it? How do you strengthen it? Well, Paul says in Romans 10, he said, faith comes from hearing. What kind of hearing? Well, hearing by the words of Christ. So all the activities in the world combined do not add a single drop to your faith. But hearing and sharing and learning God's word, this sparks faith and it helps it to grow. So what you're able to do in the name of the Lord, whether it's to resist sin or persevere in suffering or to do good or to bear spiritual fruit, whatever, all of these things are based on the strength of our faith and the strength of our faith is proportional to our exposure to God's word and God's people. I mean, there are no shortcuts. Weak attendance usually equals weak faith, which usually equals a weak Christian and very little fruit. I mean, I've seen it over and over again. Strong faith is usually a result of much teaching, and for most Christians that only comes through regular attendance. Some of you, I know some of you, great Bible students. I mean, what you get here, maybe one thing a week, but you're at home reading your Bibles, you've got a study plan, you, some of you even teaching your own children, you know, and so on. of course. You know, some will inevitably ask, if I only come to Sunday morning worship and skip the rest, can I still go to heaven? And my personal answer to this, Probably not, but not because you don't come regularly, but because your question tells me that you're a legalist and a Pharisee, that's why. You know, doing only what you have to do. You know, the kid in class, you know, the teacher says, all right, we want you to write a, you know, an essay about uh, go to Crystal Bridge you know, and, and write an essay, and there's always one guy, right? 
Can I, one, just one sheet of paper? Does it have to be written on the back too? Right away, you know, that guy's got a, he's got a problem, right? Not the right attitude. Well, that's exactly the attitude we have with God when we say, do I have to come to the other days too? People who are legalists, they do the minimum. They want to know what the minimum is and they want to do that. And I say to you, if that's your attitude, you've fallen from grace and trying to get to heaven through religious works and minimum religious works at that. At least, you were, at least, at least if you saw coming to church three times a week you know, was like a work, well at least you're doing a good work. But the person who asked this question, he, he wants to do the least amount and get to heaven. And that's just not the way, is it? It's not the most or the least. This kind of question usually shows a lack of knowledge regarding the faith. You need to come to church not to increase your attendance level. You need to come to church so you can learn about God's grace and be free from the law. If you keep this attitude, no amount of church attendance will save you. Now, I'm not saying if you don't go to Wednesday Bible class, you're going to hell. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if this is your attitude, you're more of a legalist. You're trying to be saved through works rather than through faith. We're saved by faith. We see by faith. We walk by faith. We can cast mountains into the ocean by faith. And that faith is conceived and nourished every time we come here to this place, every time we come to church. Why? Because every time we leave, we leave with a faith that is stronger. And that's what we need in this life. I don't know about you, but when I'm on my deathbed, I want my faith to be at its strongest level, not its weakest level. Number three. Being here builds the church. Hebrews 10, again I read it. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. In other words, I believe in Jesus, I believe He died for my sins, I believe I am saved because He died for me. Not because I'm good, not because I've done anything good, no. That's, that's the hope that I have. Despite my imperfection, I am saved. Why? Because I believe that the Lord has saved me. So let's hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Jesus is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. The problem was that there were Jewish Christians, you know this passage here, there were Jewish Christians who were weak in the faith and they were being tempted to return to Judaism. And their absence contributed to this weak faith that they have, and their weak faith would not sustain them under pressure. So in addition to this, and I'm talking about the people that the Hebrew writer is writing to here, in addition to this, their absence was hurting other people. This is why the writer encourages them not to abandon the assembly, and he exhorts them to give an example and a word of encouragement to who? To the other people. So your presence at all services is critical in the building up of the church. Because through regular attendance at all services, here's some of the things that happen. First of all, you're proclaiming Christ to each other in the community, 1 Corinthians 11, 26. When I come to church, the reason I'm coming to church is why? I believe in Jesus. I may not be up in the pulpit preaching, I may not be doing anything except sitting and listening, but it doesn't matter. My family, my friends, my people, my, whoever they are, they know Wednesday night, you, you come a bowling Wednesday? Hey, when is it? Uh, is it in the afternoon? No, no, Wednesday night, seven o'clock. Oh, sorry, we got church. Oh, okay, okay. You know. Have you preached the gospel to them? No. Have you explained the details of salvation? No. What have you done? You've just separated yourself. You say, yeah, but this is my priority. Why? Because I'm a Christian, that's why. Secondly, you're providing an example to other people. What do you think your absence says to the children and the younger Christians in this congregation? Well, it says, boy, when I grow up or when I'm a, an experienced saint, it'll be okay for me to skip church too. 
Because this guy over here, he says he's been a Christian for 30 years, but he only comes like on Sunday morning. I never see him Sunday night. So I guess, I guess that's the reward. You know, when I grow up and I'm a big, strong Christian, I'll be able to stay home too on Sunday night. I won't have to come. Well, it's not okay. And your example is one of weakness and immaturity, not, not strength. It also contributes towards the needs of the saints, 1 Corinthians 16 and 1. Not just money, but knowing who needs help and learning how we can serve. Can you imagine you're not here tonight? You didn't, you didn't hear that dear brother Mike McCubbin died suddenly. Well, he'd been sick a while, but you know, he just, he died. And you run into his widow at Target. She happens to be going in there to get some things. Hey, how's it going, Nell? Big smile on your face. So, so how's Mike? You didn't hear? Well, hear what? I mean, I'm taking a real out of left field example, but you know, can't build up the church if you don't know what's going on in the church. Again, it's not, it's not just about money. Who needs the help? How can we help? How can we serve? All right, need to move quickly here. Number four, and of course, we support the church leadership. In Montreal, right, the church leadership decided we don't have Sunday night service. Why? Because the majority of our people take public transportation. So it takes them an hour and a half to get to church, many of them, Sunday morning for 9.30, so they leave at eight o'clock to get to church at 9.30, and the church is over around 11.30 noon, and they don't get back home till two, with their kids on the subway in the winter. Yeah. And so the church, we didn't have elders, but you know, the, the men's meeting, they said, you know what, this, this would not be a good thing to ask people to, by the time they get home at two, in a half hour or so, to turn around and come all the way back to that. It doesn't make any sense for, for what we are. You know, urban church, downtown, public transportation type congregation. So we don't have church on Sunday night, that's fine. We decided that. Well, in this congregation many years ago, the elders decided we are going to have a Sunday evening service. And we are going to have a Wednesday night service. We think this is a good, it's a tradition, Wednesday night, but it's a good one. It's a healthy, spiritual one. And this is what we've decided to do, and we're going to do it. And the rest of us, by attending, are saying to our leaders, we agree. We're following your lead. They're here, we're here. So we support the leaders of the church. The Bible says we must submit to those whom the Lord has set over us in Christ. Hebrews 13, 17, church attendance is a way that we support their leadership. We've built the building with wood and brick, but faithfulness to all services is the cornerstone upon which the building of the congregation rests. I'll tell you something. Why do you think people are so excited? There's such a sense of excitement when we have those congregational sing-along things at the beginning of the year. Two years ago it was here. 450 people in this building on a Wednesday night. Man, a lot of people were pumped. The singing was awesome. People were, you know, red-cheeked. It was just so great to have so many people. And then the following week, you know, we went back to being maybe a quarter of the congregation here. And the only, we, we didn't do anything different, nothing different. We sang the songs that are familiar, somebody prayed, somebody preached a really great lesson, we offered in it. We do exactly what we do every single Wednesday. What was the difference? Everybody was here. Everybody was pumped, everybody was encouraged. So as I close, I want to say to you know, all those who put down church attendance as a problem, that their struggle is nothing new, okay? So don't feel like, whoa, this is just me. It was there when the church was established. We read about it in Hebrews 10. And the Bible says it will be there until the end of the world. Matthew 24, 12, Jesus says, in the end the love of many will grow cold. The solution then, now, and in the future has always been and will always be the same. Number one, begin to cultivate the habit of regular attendance to all services. Number two, get involved in the work of the church. And number three, realize that coming to church is always the best choice 
and God will reward you for it. I've never met anybody who got poorer because they decided to attend all of the services of the church. I never met anybody, no one in 38 years has ever come up to me and say, you know, well I tried that coming to church all the time and boy, my, my total income dropped by 25%. Never, not one person. I'm still waiting for that guy. All right, so that's number six, neglecting church. We move on to number five next week. Thank you for your attention.